Good evening, everybody, again. Greetings from the student ministry. I'm really excited for this opportunity to spend tonight with you. Uh, this last, last Monday when we were in staff meeting, Jeff mentioned that he was going to be gone uh, for the night. He's, he's on a retreat for, uh, with, for pastors where they're, they're actually retreating to work on sermons together and, and think about how God's Word may shape congregations in our area. So it's, it's through our association. So excited to hear about how that, that's going when he gets back and how that will be used to then be passed on to us as he proclaims God's Word to us. Um, but I'm especially thankful to you guys, and, and I, I kind of went around to try to introduce myself and, and get to know some of you. Um, but I watched last week's Bible study with Jeff, and he did mention that I was going to be here, and you still showed up. So, I mean, thank you, but also maybe, I don't know, it's, that's pretty trusting. Um, I mean, there's really, there's really a whole bunch of other things you could have done tonight. I mean, date night, uh, there's just whatever, you could have got ice cream and just went home. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you could have done. Uh, but I am honored that you would still show up to be here as we go through God's Word. If you don't know who I am, my name is Michael Van Gorp. I am the student pastor here at First Baptist Conroe, and i um, just excited tonight to be able to jump into the study of the book of James with you. Uh, tonight we're going to be digging into verses 9 through 18 of chapter 1, and we're going to be kind of focusing on this idea of of building a theology of trials and temptations. That's going to be our goal tonight. So, so hopefully by the time you leave here tonight, you have an understanding of how trials and temptations work in our life, what, what they're trying to do, what, what God's trying to do through them. And part of that is we're going to look back a little bit at last week and kind of gain some context um, because James begins to talk about trials in the, in the few verses before. So we're going to jump back, but why do we do that? Because we need that context, because we need to remember that uh, the, the epistle of James, his, his letter to the people wasn't written with chapters and verses and sections in mind. It was one letter. And uh, so, so when we read it, we need to understand that it was supposed to be read together. Uh, so when we break it into little sections like this, it's fun and we get to pick out little things, but we need to make sure that we don't miss out on the bigger context of that. Um, and also, it's always good to look back because then we can kind of see, okay, did we apply that last week? I think that's sometimes the, the tough part, right? We, we come to church on Sundays, we hear a good sermon, we're like, wow, that really challenged me. And then Monday comes and we forgot everything that we just learned in the last 24 hours. So it's good to look back and see, how did I do in applying God's Word to my life over this last week? And then also, oh yeah, I had that one question pop up, because then we can gain some clarity as we go. So let's jump in together. We're going to be James chapter 1, and let's start in verse 2 together. And I'll just read through verse 8. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So as, as we pull from that and then go on into chapter or verse 9 tonight, there's a few things that we need to kind of reiterate and re-understand as, as we jump in that uh, we can find joy in our trials. That was, that was one of the main things that Jeff brought up last week, that we can find joy in our trials. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to be super excited about them, because there's nothing exciting about going through trials. I mean, 
It's exciting to wake up and go to Six Flags. Well, maybe not for us. Well, maybe for when you're younger, it's exciting to wake up and go to Six Flags. Uh, it, it's exciting when things are going good in your life. It's not so exciting when you wake up and you're in the midst of a trial. But we can still find joy in that because we know that God is up to something. We may not know what that is. We may not have the full idea of what God's plan is, but we know that he is working, that he is doing something. And because of that, we can find joy. In verse 4, we get this idea that the, the goal of God is not for us to be happy, but for him to make us holy. The goal is, is not happiness, it's holiness. And uh, one, of the, one of the words he used here and how testing is, is worked is this idea of a silversmith. Do you know how silversmiths make sure and test the silver? They heat it up. They get it, they get it going. They get it really hot where it, it melts, and then all of a sudden all the impurities start to rise to the top. And then once all the junk is on top, then the silversmith comes through and scrapes all the junk off the top. And that's what God does with us. When we get in pressure-packed, heated situations in life, we get heated up, the junk in our lives goes to the top, and then he's able to scrape off. And do you know how the silversmith knows when that silver is pure and ready? When he can look at it and see his reflection. And it's the same for God. When, when we're ready is when God can look at us and, and see his reflection in us. So the goal is not happiness. The goal is not to make our life easy, but it's to help us pursue holiness. The third thing we can pull out of, of last week is that even when we're in the midst of trials, we can still ask God for wisdom. Yeah, we may not know what's going on. We may not get the full picture, but we can ask God. We can go to God and go, okay, God, what are you trying to do here? Not, God, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to do to me? No, but God, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? How are you trying to grow me? Um, these are the types of questions we can ask, and as we go through the trial, those things will be revealed to us. And the last thing uh, we can take away from last week is that uh, double-minded doubt is spiritually unhealthy. And... Um, I know Jeff kind of mentioned this last week a little bit, but what we see a lot is when bad things happen in people's lives, the first thing they do is they run away from church. They run away from God. They run away from the family of God. And it should be the exact opposite. We should run to the family of God. We should run to him uh, to seek that understanding. Um, it's when we're in these situations where we're like, okay, God, whatever. I don't really think you exist, but if you're out there, if you are the big man in the sky, you know, Make that cloud turn into a turtle, and I'll believe you're real. You know, that's just crazy talk. But when we go, God, I trust you, even though I don't know what's going on right now, I trust you, that's when we get the wisdom. Okay, so with that covered, let's kind of jump into verses 9 through 12, because now we're going to kind of make this, this transition. James lays out how we can find joy in the trial and how we're supposed to kind of work through the trial. Uh, but tonight we're going to start off with how we can fight this doubt that comes up. And the key to fighting doubt is praise. So if you're taking notes, if you want to write something down, the first thing is the, the key to fighting doubt is praise. I'm going to take a drink. easier. Oh, did I move too far? <laughs> I was told I couldn't move like a foot, so that's just for the camera. That's just for those online. Okay. Let's, uh, the key to fighting doubt is praise. Let's read verse 9 together. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. But wait, I thought when we become Christians, we all start getting more wealthy and our problems start to go away. And um, 
I have, I have good health, and my whole life seems to be prosperous. Change the channel on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. We, if we've been around for more than a few years, we, we recognize that that's not the case. But that's what's being sold, right? So we, we have to make sure we understand that. And right here, James says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. These early believers were living in poverty. They had, they had the dispersion was when the Jews had to leave Jerusalem because of First, they were getting persecuted, and they had to make this decision in Acts chapter 8. Do we stay here and die, or do we run away, spread the gospel, get out of town, and live to see another day? And they choose to just go out into the countryside, try to make their, their own way, try to, try to start their lives over again. And then, on top of that, during this time in, in the historical record, there was a famine occurring. So now they've left their city where all their commerce was, where their jobs were. They go out into the countryside where they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll just kind of start this simple life out here and, and farm the land and, and do the things that we need to do to survive. And then famine happens. So you can imagine that they're living lives of extreme poverty. So what are they supposed to boast in? Because if because if you look at if you look at Facebook today, what do we boast in? We boast in our accomplishments. We boast in our kids' accomplishments. So um, one one of my favorite things is just going on Facebook and then kind of like categorize. I'm I'm crazy. Okay, so just get that out of the way. Uh, I go on Facebook and then I categorize the different types of posts. So I kind of make a mental note like okay. This one was, I'm trying to show off to everybody else. This one was, um, I'm hoping that these certain people see it so that they'll accept me. Um, when, when you're dealing with teenagers, they, they put on a mask online and they kind of create this other identity. It's really crazy. Uh, just don't get online. Just don't do it. Um, but they begin to brag about things that aren't even real. And I think sometimes with our spiritual lives, we can do the same things. We can kind of brag about these unreal things. Or we just ignore our spiritual lives altogether, and we go, man, how great is God? Because I'm great. You're like, wait, what? Like, yeah, I'm like, um, I've got this amazing house. I've got this amazing family. I've got this amazing kids. And um, my kids did this and this and this and this and this, and they hit a home run, and they made an A, and they danced. And they did all these other things, and they all degraded everything. Hashtag blessed. They're like, well, you're not. I think you're missing the point. Because all you did was just brag about how great you were. And then attach God's name to it. We can't sign God's name off on our own list. So... What are they bragging about? Well, we need to understand what it means to boast. It doesn't mean just to brag, but it means to praise. It means to praise. So he's, what James isn't saying here is that, hey, you know, hey, go tell everybody how poor you are and then how excited you are to be poor. Because sometimes we, we do that too, don't we? Oh man, I'm just... Everything's so bad. Everything's so bad. Everything's so bad. Please give me attention. Everything's so bad. That's not what he's saying either. He's not saying, hey, let people look how holy you are because of how much in poverty you are. Here's where it starts. It starts with the attitude of, I may not have these things, Fill in the blank. But I have breath in my lungs. I'm, I may not have this status, but I have life today. 
I may not be at this level in society, but I do have these blessings that God has given me. It starts with that attitude of thankfulness. And then it, it leads to this exaltation in Christ. Which means it doesn't matter what I have. So even though I boast in the little things I have, it doesn't even matter if I have that because I have Christ. I boast in Christ who saved me. Who even though I'm poor, he saved me. Even though I have nothing, he saved me. Even though I have nothing to give, he saved me. Even though I've gone through this in my life and now I'm at the bottom of society, he saved me. We boast in Christ. We boast in the exaltation in Christ. But let's turn it over. Verse 10. And the rich man in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So there's this thing about Christianity where all are welcome. (laughs) It's all right. It's fun. I enjoy it. We're having fun. Awesome. There's this amazing thing about Christianity where it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, All are welcome. So we get this kind of dualistic approach here where James starts off with the poor, but then he goes to the rich person and warns them as well. He tells them that rich people will experience humility in life. So sorry if you're rich. Uh, Don't mean to hurt your feelings, but at some point you will experience humility. And you're laughing at me probably right now and going, oh, I've had plenty of it in my life. See, this is a warning. And James says we, be, we should be thankful for these warnings. We, we live in the, the richest country in the world where just to, where we're at right now in society and, and like I just think about where I'm at as a 30-year-old person living on, and what I've been blessed with that, that I'm in the top 10% of all people in the world just because of where I'm at. Like, that's just crazy to think about. It doesn't take a whole lot to be beyond blessed. But we get these warnings, and we should be thankful for them. We should praise God for these warnings where we experience humility. Because if we didn't get these warnings, here's here's the danger. The temptation that we would face if we didn't get these warnings is that we have it so good that we don't need God. And that seems to be the constant thing going around. Like we don't even think about God because who needs God when I drive a $100,000 vehicle and I have a golf membership to every course in the area? I experience God on the greens. I experience God on the lakes. That's all I need. I've got this huge boat that I can go fishing in whenever I want to. Who needs God? Who needs God? My life's great. I got everything that I could ever want or desire. Why do I need God? And then we get these moments of humility where we lose control. Where money fades quickly. Where that 401k or that retirement fund that we had set up that was invested in that thing that could never fail. (laughs) You were set for life. And now you're like, I might have to go work at that gas station on the corner. Maybe it's just that you have a really good job. You know, one of those jobs where you don't really do a lot of work, but you make a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, you get the pink slip out of nowhere. But you just bought the house. 
See, there's, and if it's not money, then there's the things that money can't buy. Money can't guarantee a clean bill of health. When you get that call from the doctor, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It can't solve relational problems. Money, money can't buy back a spouse who you've pushed away. Money can't, money can't get your kids to come back and visit. Money also can't bring back those that have passed away. I mean, unless you're Frank, it's Dr. Frankenstein, but that's... Money can't do those things. And James tells us here, yeah, the, the people in poverty have it rough. They, they go through tough things, but they can be thankful to God when, when God gives them anything. And they can be thankful to God because they've been accepted. And the same is true for the rich man. Because they've been blessed, but also there's moments when God brings them down to understand that they still need God, just like everybody else. And we can praise him in those moments because what God is doing is offering us grace. He's offering us mercy because we're blinded by everything in our lives. And he says, wait, 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 wait. There's still one thing that you're missing. It's crazy, if we, look, if we look back in Scripture, how many times Jesus warns us. Jesus warned that it was harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Not impossible, but definitely harder. We get the story of the rich young ruler who comes, comes to Jesus, and, and Jesus lays out the list of the Ten Commandments before him. He goes, I've got those down. And Jesus goes, okay, well, sell everything and give it to the poor. And then he walks away sad because that was really his God. One follower wants to follow Jesus, and, but he wants to turn back and go get his inheritance from burying his father. He wanted that money. He wanted, that, wanted what he had earned. And Jesus said, if they turn back from the plow, they're not fit for the kingdom. And when Jesus sends out his disciples, what does he send them with? Next to nothing. He doesn't send them with a pocket full of money. He says, just take what you got and go. If we try to find our life in the riches of the world, we'll lose it. That's, that's the warning. That's the warning. So ultimately, here, here's the cool thing once again, though. Being rich or poor has no eternal consequences. You could be rich in this room. You could be poor in this room. doesn't matter. When we get to heaven, it's not going to matter. There will be both rich and poor in heaven, and there will be both rich and poor in hell. It has nothing to do with our status. It has everything to do with having a real authentic faith which is what James is trying to get us to see. But God uses life circumstances for both of us to try to pull us to himself. Verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. This is where he kind of brings the whole trial, the trials of life. This is kind of that summary statement that he, he ends with. I, I think Jeff mentioned this last week, but if not, here's just kind of a reminder. Um, the book of James, it's, it's written a lot like Proverbs, which is why a lot of people like it, because you can, you know, you can put it on a blanket or a pillow and, or a coffee mug, and it's nice and friendly, out of context, of course. Uh, but... James actually does give us some summary statements, and this is one of them. After he talks about all these trials, blessed is the man who remains steadfast. Does this sound familiar, this language? What does it remind you of? Huh? 
the Sermon on the Mount. Kind of reads like a beatitude, doesn't it? It's almost like the lost beatitude. Maybe, maybe we call the History Channel. They can do a, one of those fake documentaries on it for next Easter. The lost beatitude of the Bible. Um, but it does. It, it reads like one of those uh, beatitudes. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Steadfast. Unchanging. Unwavering. Unmoved. And, and then why is that person considered blessed? What do they receive? They receive the crown of life. The crown of life. So let's dig into what the crown of life is. Uh, but before that, I have a question. What if, what if we don't pass the test? This is how my brain works. Was anybody like, I was pretty good in school, but science, I was, I was terrible. I once made a negative 25 on an assignment in science, and I went to tutorials to do it. How does that even work? I had to beg my chemistry teacher to pass me. I told her I'd mow her yard with a pair of scissors. So what, what if we don't pass the test? I have to retake it. So think about this. Maybe if you're constantly finding yourself battling the same types of things over and over again, maybe if you're finding yourself in the same types of situations with the same types of people that are pushing the same types of buttons, maybe you're just retaking the test. Maybe. So maybe you need to do a little studying before the next retest. To remind myself of that one. But if we pass this, the test, we do receive the crown of life. Um, I've been blessed to be able to graduate four times, if you count kindergarten, which I don't know why, because it's kindergarten, no one cares. Uh, but throughout life, we get different graduation caps for the different tests, right? And it's, it's the same thing whenever we think about life. If we pass this test, then we get this cap. And if we pass this test, we get this cap. And all these caps represent is just, I was able to be steadfast through this season, through this challenge, through this, this trial, this, you know, me and my wife for a year, we, we just fought every day. We couldn't communicate until we finally started working together. And then we started, finally started listening to each other. And then through that, we had victory in that area of our life, and then we got that graduation cap. Uh, maybe it is, um, just trying to think of something else. Maybe most of you have had teenagers before. Um, so maybe it was, every day was a screaming match with my teenager. But through that season of life, I continued to talk with them, and I never gave up trying to have that relationship with them. I never just sent them to their room and said, you know what, you figure it out on your own. But I kept trying to preach the gospel to them every single day throughout that season. And eventually, you have that relationship with them today as adult children, and it blesses your life every single day. That's that cap that you got for graduation, that graduating that trial. So we have those smaller caps, but then um, we have the ultimate crown. We have the ultimate crown, the crown of eternal life that we receive at the end of our lives when we've run the race, when we've run it with endurance, when we finished it, when we get to stand before the king and go, and he says to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the ultimate graduation cap that we get. And there's that last part of that verse. We can't, we can't ignore this. Receive the crown of life, which God has promised to who? To those who love him. But when I thought it was about faith, you'll see this often in the book of James, but James equates 
faith, the word faith, with real byproducts of that faith. And what he's telling us here is, if you have faith, if you have genuine, real faith, then that's going to come out as real love for the Father. If, if you have faith, then it's going to produce the fruit of love for God. If someone is going, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't love God. That's like an oxymoron. It just doesn't fit. Right? It's trying to play Legos, but you have like the off-brand Legos. They don't fit together. It doesn't work. So it proves our love to him. It's easy to prove love to somebody who gives you everything you want. I, I don't know about you, but I didn't have that parent. <laughs> um, Dad, can I have this? No. He was like the captain of no. Dad, can I go? No. I didn't even finish. No. No. Can I go hang out with my friends? No. Uh, but it's when you're a kid, it's really easy to love those that give you everything you want. Think about your favorite teacher ever. I want some names. Who remembers your favorite teacher ever? Hazel Dorsey. Hazel Dorsey, awesome. What does she teach? English. English, okay. Did you have one? Yes, Miss Deaver. Miss Deaver? English. English. You got one? Lola Adams. Lola Adams. Which one? Algebra. Algebra. <laughs> <laughs> English, English. We read books that changed our lives. Algebra, numbers. Okay. No, but we, we have these people in our minds, right, that we remember that really made a difference. Were they always, did they always give us what we wanted? <laughs> when we're in high school, our favorite teachers are the ones that are like, I don't care, eat popcorn, watch a movie, I'll give you an A at the end of the six weeks. I got a game to go coach. You know, that, those were like, yeah. We love coach. He's our favorite teacher. We don't do anything. But the teachers that we remember were the ones that pushed us. We don't remember anything from their class. And often we look back and go, you didn't teach me anything. And then you go to college or you go on in life and you're trying to do life. And you're like, I, why don't I know this? I should know this. Everybody else knows this. See, the teachers we look back and love are those that prepared us for our future. Jesus isn't interested in being our buddy that gives us what we need or what we think we need. What he's more interested in is preparing us for our future. So when we look back on what he did for us as we live life, it just increases our faith, which also increases our love for him and what he did for us. And in those moments, we get to display this real genuine love. I remember when my grandfather died. And, you know, it's kind of, kind of shook me up a little bit. I was kind of the first person in my life to, to pass away that was close. And I remember being at the funeral, and it's a sad funeral, or it's a funeral, of course, people are sad. And at the end of the funeral, my grandma was standing beside the casket greeting people. And as people came through with tears, she wasn't happy, but she met them with joy. And I remember that being different to me. I remember after asking her, like, well, what? How could you stand here and, like, you just lost your husband, this person you lived with, and you cared for each other together? What, how could you just, I mean, I don't even know if I could stand. I just remember saying, like, well, I know where he's at. I, I, know, I know my eternity. I know where I'm going. I'm prepared. I just want to be there for others that maybe don't know that. And see, sometimes it's in our toughest life situations where we get to display the real love that we have for God. It kind of goes back to our trials where we have that opportunity to show our faith in the midst of that. 
Our love for Jesus should be our main motivation. You know, you go to the doctor and he goes, hey, you're overweight, you need to lose weight because you could get X, Y, Z. Those are pretty good motivations, right? But our main motivation should be Jesus. Because sometimes we have some pretty crummy motivations. Well, I shouldn't do drugs. Okay, why? Well, because if I get caught, then I might go to jail. Okay, well, that's, that's a pretty good motivation, but if that's, all, if that's the only thing that motivates you, then the only thing that's really motivating you is not getting caught. And eventually, you're going to try to find a way to get around that. But if it's, I can't do this because I love Jesus so much, then there's nothing that should shake us from that. Because then we're making the choice, do I love this more than I love my Savior? And I don't think that's an answer we want to get wrong. Okay, so that kind of, that kind of leaves us at the end of, of trials. So let's jump into temptations. So... Let's go for it. Verse 13, uh, if, you, if you want to make a note, I just called this the dangerous path of temptation. The dangerous path of temptation. Verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself, he himself tempts no one. All right, so let's, let's play with the words here at the beginning. Notice that it says when and not if. Who in here has been tempted before? Right? I'm going to assume that you just can't raise your arm if, if you're not. Um, I mean, any, anytime someone has ice cream, I'm like, I, I mean, I, I ate three plates of food, but you said ice cream? Um, so we... We've all been tempted. We will all face temptation. If, if we're not facing it right now in this moment, we'll face it on the way home. If not on the way home, it'll be when we wake up in the morning. It's always a part of our life. No one's exempt. But we know one thing from this verse right from the get-go. We can't blame God for this temptation. We can't blame God. It says, let no one say, this is a command, let no one say, I am being tempted by God. So whatever our situation is, whatever the temptation may be, we can't look at that and go, man, God is just really tempting me right now. And those words might seem crazy, but let, let's, let's maybe put it in a little bit different way. Let's go back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay? The serpent... Satan comes to Eve and then gets her with that question. Surely you won't die. Surely God didn't really say what he said he did, right? Well, I don't know. Maybe not. Okay. She partakes of the fruit. Adam, being a great leader and a great strong man of faith, said, oh, let me have some too. And when God comes to them and when God is, is confronting them in that moment, What's Adam's response? God, it's your fault. It's this woman that you gave me. He was saying, God, you tempted me. All right? Let's rewrap it in today's, today's society, in today's culture. I was born this way. I was born this way. If God didn't want me to do it, then he would have made me in a way that doesn't desire it. Has anybody ever heard that? We'll see in a second where that comes from. So how do we know when we're in temptation? Because this is important. We need to recognize when we're being tempted versus when we're just living life. Or else we're just going to be like, oh, I hope I'm not being tempted. I hope I'm not being, oh, no. 
Because then you'd be like, well, I just have to avoid temptation. Well, what are you going to do? Not go to the grocery store? I mean, never turn on the TV, never walk outside. We can't, we can't live lives like that. So, so how do we know when we're being tempted? Uh, when you are tempted to do things that are outside of God and his word, that is not God. So that's a good rule. If someone or something is trying to get you to do something that is not according to God's word, then you can better believe that you're being tempted in that moment. So that's a good way, good rule of thumb for us. We learn something very interesting here. God is not tempted. Let me reverse, let me go back to verse 13 real quick here. I don't want to say I'm, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot be tempted. God is not tempted. God is perfect in every way, and there's no sin in him. Here, here's the $10 word for the night. Impeccability. This is known as the theology of impeccability, God's impeccability, which just means the quality of being without error or fault. So when we think about God and his character and who he is, he is completely 100% perfect. He is completely 100% good. There's no error or fault with him. If there was, he's not God. If there was, the whole universe would crumble. The whole universe rests on the fact that God is impeccable, that he is perfect in every single way. So, imagine for a moment that sin works on a radio frequency. You know how radio works? Of course you do, you have radios. I'm just kidding. I'm not James, I'm not going to make fun of your age. Uh, so, but radio, it sends out a signal, it sends out radio waves. And there's receivers that receive those waves and that message and then is able to transmit that message. So think about it for just a moment. Sin sends out a frequency like a radio wave. Being born in sin, we have that natural receiver that's able to communicate with it. We can receive that temptation. We can receive that sin, that, those thoughts, those desires. We can receive it. And then we're able to either make the decision whether to go through with it or not go through with it, but it's, it's there. We can understand it. But with God, Him being perfect, He doesn't have this receiver. So when the radio waves of sin get thrown at Him, it just kind of bounce off. There's nothing to receive it. He can't receive sin. Okay, so how, what, what's a good picture of this? Go to Jesus being tempted in the desert. 40 days without food. I would be pretty grumpy. I go 40 minutes without a snack, and sometimes I'm grumpy. 40, 40 days in the desert, he gets subjected to the greatest temptations that the devil could throw at him. And he seems to be unfazed by it. Almost as if whatever temptation that Satan tried to throw at him, it just didn't stick. Instead, he just goes, okay, whatever that was, here's what God's word says. And just, just like he can't receive it, he also can't send the signal either. He tempts no one. So just like he, can't, he doesn't have the thing to receive a sin signal, he also doesn't have it to send it. Verse 14, But each, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. The devil made me do it. No, try again. We can't blame the devil for temptation. We can't blame culture for temptation. We try to, right? Oh, that music these days. The music is only a reflection of our hearts. These kids listen to the worst music. 
because it's being written by people with hearts that are far from God. And it's being listened to by people with hearts that are far away from God. The video games are so atrocious. Yeah, they're being created by people with hearts far away from God. And they're being played by people with hearts far away from God. It's not the video games. It's not the music. It's not the culture. It's not the devil. He didn't make you do it. So who's to blame? Us. We can only blame ourselves. But we don't like that answer, do we? Because we don't, we don't accept responsibility for our actions. Uh, it's almost as if James has been a pastor before. That he's witnessed the human nature play out in people, where he sees people interact with their world and make really ugly, nasty, bad decisions. Ultimately, we sin because we want to and we choose to. See, here's the trick. Satan wants us to blame it on someone or someone else. He wants us to look at him and go, oh, Satan made me do it. Here's why. Because change can only happen in us when we look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. Until we do that, until, as long as we're blaming other things and culture and Satan and that person and this person and my wife and my kids and whatever, whatever else it may be, as long as we're doing that, we are not changing. Jesus came to heal the sick. Sick come to the hospital because they know they're sick. If we're not going to the hospital, then we're not receiving the healing. And what you're probably seeing now is that sin isn't just an event, it's a process. Verse 15 says, Then the desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So we see these, these four things, desire, deception, disobedience, and death take place. This natural progression, desire. Desire is not bad in itself. That we're, we're given godly desires to keep us alive. I get hungry because food keeps me alive, right? I get thirsty because water keeps me alive. I get tired because sleep keeps me alive. There's other desires that we have that I feel uncomfortable talking about with my grandparents in the room. But you get the idea? That desire only becomes dangerous when we start to wonder how we can fulfill that desire in an illegitimate way. When we go, I need this, and this is how God wants me to get this, but what if I did it this way? What if instead of doing things the way that God has shown me or told me, what if instead I try to get it from this other place? Yes, I'm supposed to eat food, but what if I just eat whatever I want, whenever I want, that turns into gluttony? What about whenever I'm tired and I just want to sleep, but I sleep all the time, and I sleep to get out of things? then it becomes laziness. When God created sex for marriage and, and all the things that it's supposed to be, but then I try to get it in a different way, then it becomes lust and adultery. It's in these moments when our minds and hearts begin to wander that we need to call up to God for strength, not wait. That's when it needs to be cut off. That's when we need to go, okay, this is where I need help. Uh, if, if not, then, then we leave ourselves open to deception. And then deception happens when we're drawn and enticed in by this illegitimate option. Um, who likes to fish? All right, any hunters? Okay. So here's something that's very interesting about hunting and fishing, okay? From, from all the research that I could come up with, bears don't like to wear traps for shoes. And fish don't like the taste of hooks. And mice don't like back massages from traps. The bait never reveals the consequences. The bait deceives us. It says, hey, look at this option. It's way easier. It's way better. And we don't see the consequences. 
And the other thing about that bait that gets thrown in, the fisherman isn't by the bait, right? They're in the boat or on the shore. And as, as Satan tempts, as he puts those things out before you, he's sitting on the shore laughing. He's not sitting there in the background going like, oh, I hope they do it. And you're like, who are you? Why are you here? He's hiding. Because if we saw him, then we would know. All we know is that when we take the bait, we're hooked. We're hooked. And then that leads to disobedience. We take the bait. We've made the choice. What we've decided, we've made the choice. I want my will over God's will. I want to love myself over loving God. And sometimes we make these choices and we go, but it felt good, so I know that's what I'm supposed to do. But it felt good. Isn't that what it's about? And choices are never really based on feelings. They're, they're always based on our will. Because in your heart, you decided that you wanted, you wanted your way more than God himself. And you believed the lie that there wasn't any consequences, but there is. And that leads to death. Um, so I just want to read that a little, little bit here. Then desire that is conceived gives birth to sin. That's a really weird way of putting that. But think about it. Think about the joy of pregnancy. The joy. I remember when my wife was like, hey, we're pregnant. Well, first I was a little bit terrified because I didn't know what I was going to do. I was too young. It was, it was scary. I was kind of like, how are we going to pay for that? Um, but there's joy in that anticipation for that child to come. It's kind of the same thing when we, when we receive the deception and we bring it in and we, and, we, and we choose disobedience. At first we're like, this is exciting. And then when it comes to fruition, when it's time for a birth, out pops this grotesque, dead, broken, nothing. The this, this sin, this sin child is always stillborn. It always ends in heartbreak. And it just took away from you. Sin's advertised price is always lower than the actual cost. You know, we bought a home and we settled on a final price and we're like, yes, we got, it's a good price for today. I mean, everything's ridiculous. We bought this home, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, but there's this cost, and there's this cost, and there's this cost, and there's this cost, and I don't know where any of this money is going to come from anymore. But that's how sin works. Oh, it's only $10. It's really 20 but we're not going to tell you that. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. He's, he's just once again warning us, like, hey, just... Don't be deceived. Stop at deception. Stop, stop, stop. In those moments, whenever you feel like you're about to, to, to follow the bait, stop. Ask God for strength. Don't go any further. God desires to receive, for us to receive the crown of life. Satan wants to still kill and destroy. Don't. Stop. Don't fall for deception. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So how do we know something is from God? It's good. How do we know something is not from God? It's not good. All right, that's pretty easy. You get 100. You pass the test. Caps for everybody. All right, God is never changing. God is never changing. This, this idea of calling him the father of lights, it's talking about the sun and moon. I know it's not really a light, but there, you got it, right? There's star, and the stars, it's talking about the heavenly lights. They never stop shining, just like God is never changing. But sometimes the earth gets dark, doesn't it? When does the earth get dark? When it turns its back on the sun.
There's no variation or shadow due to change, but there is shadow and variation due to us turning away from the Father of lights. Verse 18, and we'll finish it out here. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here we see that we've been talking about our will and how we try to get our way. And here we finally get the picture of his will. And what's his desire? for all things to come to repentance and faith. Through what? His word. We don't come to faith. We're not saved because of our parents, our culture, our our family. It's when we come face to face with the word of God, his promise of salvation. There's also something very powerful in the word. I told you earlier that Jesus, instead of receiving the sin, all he does is it just kind of bounces off, and then he throws scripture back at the devil, right? When was the last time in our temptation that we threw scripture back at the devil? First fruits. The first fruits were the best a person had to offer, the cream of the crop. That's who we are. It's a train. That's what we are. We're the first fruits. We're the best that God has to offer. We're the cream of the crop. Why? Because we're sons and daughters of the king. And what's happened is, is sometimes we lose that identity and who we are in Christ. And when we lose that identity, that's when we leave ourselves up for temptation. The other thing about first fruits, and this is my last point, I promise. The other thing about first fruits is that they were offered to God and trust that there was more to come. When people brought their first fruit offerings, it was, God, you've given us this great harvest. This is the best that we have to offer, and we trust you that you're going to provide for us and give us tenfold. Maybe, just maybe, what God is doing through your life in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the test, in the midst of the temptation, is he's preparing you and changing you and purifying you so that you can be the first fruits, the example that's being set for generations and generations to come. Through your family, your church family, and everybody else that you come in contact with. Are we living as the first fruits? That's the question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for we thank you for the trials. That God, even when when we're lowly and we're struggling that you give us the blessings we need to to live each day to glorify you. And God, that even, even when we've been blessed beyond measure, that you have grace and mercy towards us, that you would humble us so that we can recognize you and who you are. Father, help us to, to live in a way that honors you and shows the love that we have for you. Help us to face temptations, to not be deceived by the lure of sin, to not fall victim of that deception, but instead to trust you, to draw closer to you, to lean on you in our weakness, to not turn away from you, Father of lights, but to turn towards you. Help us to live as your first fruits. May we live lives that affect generations to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.